Today in Dirt Lifestyle, we're gonna build a one-of-a-kind air system, and even though this is gonna be complicated, it's gonna be very worth it. We've already thrown tons of custom work and parts at this 2003 Land Rover Discovery. One-ton axles, custom bumpers, custom sliders, a roof rack, the works. Now it's time to move on to the finer details, and we're gonna start with onboard air. I wanna to try to build the best DIY 12-volt air system I possibly can. It needs to be fast, we're gonna build our own air tank, we're going to build a system that is able to actuate two rear airbags independently. We're gonna power our lockers. We're gonna be able to fill up 37s quickly. We have a big demand and a big video, and it all starts with me taking some stuff out of this engine bay to make room for our compressors. I just freed up a bunch of space under the hood. We're gonna relocate the battery up a little bit, and then we'll be able to fit a compressor here. And then I'm gonna relocate our air box and fit a compressor here. The hardware that we're using is the Smitty Built. Uh, I don't remember the model number, but I will definitely link this Smitty Built compressor into the description. I got these from Four Wheel Parts. These are a bargain. And the reason that I got these instead of the ARB Twin, because a channel of my size could just email ARB and they'd probably send one out, is because I wanted to build a system that is affordable to anyone who watches this video. These compressors, are made to be portable, but you can absolutely hard mount them. And when you look at the CFM rating, it is a fast compressor. 5.6 CFM is bananas. This is almost as fast as an Airbnb Twin, and we're gonna be using two of these, which will make it almost twice as fast as an Airbnb Twin. So this is gonna be able to fill those 37s up super fast. We're also going to be building our, air, our own air tank, like I mentioned earlier. So I've got these tank fittings. These are just ends that are gonna be welded to some, uh, some three inch Schedule 40 black iron pipe that I have laying around in the shop. And then we're gonna be welding these different fittings and whatnot. And I mean, there's just a whole lot, whole lot to plumbing. And then we're gonna be plumbing in our, uh, our air lockers and we've got a lot to do in this video. Pulling a bunch of measurements and doing a basic layout for the brackets on this compressor, I decided to strip it off of the factory base plate and take a look at these rubber foot pads that come with it. It looks like these compressor mounts that come with the compressor are gonna work perfect with the stuff that I have laying around, which is great because this is just one less thing for me to buy. Putting together this bracket system, I wanted to challenge myself not to do any aluminum welding. I just wanted to use cutting tools and forming tools like this metal brake in order to accomplish the shapes and everything that I want so I can secure it down without having to weld any extra tabs. That way, those of you watching at home don't get discouraged because you don't have a TIG welder. I believe there's a way to get it done without the tools you want and with the ones you have. The bracket system for the compressors is coming together pretty quickly and before I get started on the driver's side, I wanna show you exactly what I've done to the passenger side because I know I'm gonna get a ton of questions from discovery owners on how I did this. And it's a two bracket system and once it's all mounted in there, it's gonna be really difficult for you to see exactly what I did. So with the compressor mounted in here, I was able to figure out how to do the battery tie down because width wise, they were gonna to need to take up some of the same space. I figured it'd be easier for me to lift one up higher than the other one. And because the top of the compressor has this curve, it seemed like putting the battery up top made a lot more sense. So the battery is gonna sit right here into this battery tray. And I haven't screwed anything in yet, just so I could show you exactly how I have this set up. I just put bends in this aluminum in a way and then drilled holes to where I could take advantage of the factory uh, mounting brackets for that system that we pulled out of here. I have it anchored, uh, I zipped it into the core support with some self-tapping screws that are super heavy duty and rated for outdoor use. And then this is going to mount down on top of it. I'm gonna mount it into the fender there and then we're gonna zip it down using some, uh, probably some quarter inch stainless steel button head hardware. If you guys watch the channel, you know I love that stuff. So once I get all this zipped in here and I get the battery put in, we can move on to the air intake side.
there's not a whole lot of extra space under the hood of the Disco 2. So we had to think outside the box. I removed that big toolbox, speaking of which, on this side, and it made it to where we were able to put the stuff in here that we need um, and get rid of the stuff that we don't need. I don't need to put tool storage under the hood. I have tool storage in the back. And because of the success on that side, I decided to mimic it on the passenger side. It's a different shape, but I was able to just kind of maneuver things around in a way that it still fit and it has the same basic elements and it, it looks like almost a mirrored version of what's on the other side. So I added a second battery, which I was not expecting to be able to do and I'm excited that I'm able to do. And now we have just enough space basically for a tiny air box behind the second battery and in front of the ABS module. So in the future, we will build one of those, not today, but we will build one of those in the near future. The next thing we need to do is tie these two compressors together. And originally I was gonna build a manifold from scratch. I was kind of looking forward to doing that, but I just came up with another idea. I'm gonna change where I mount the tank and I will be able to utilize the tank as our manifold. So both compressors will go into the tank and then we're gonna have extra ports that I'm gonna build onto the tank that'll, that is gonna supply all of our stuff. It's gonna make more sense as we go along. But I'm thinking that we put a tank right under the winch right here. And I think before that's gonna make sense, we should look at the, the stuff that we're gonna use to make the tank. And then I'll, I'll draw a little drawing and show you exactly how I plan on plumbing the tank. If you've never piped or plumbed a system of this type, it could be a little bit intimidating. So I wanna take a minute and just walk you through mine. And I think that if you are, if you're trying to plan a system like this for the first time, some of this information might help you. So right now we have two compressors. Each one is 5.6 CFM maximum. And we wanna maximize that amount of CFM whenever we hook an air chuck to the tire. So we're gonna size our system accordingly to make sure that when we have these things going full blast and under optimal conditions, we can try and reach that full 11.3 CFM from the compressor to the tire to fill it quickly. So these are both gonna be using 3 8 line to feed our air tank and our air tank has three purposes. It is going to be air storage, it is gonna help dry the air, and it's going to be a manifold because we're gonna drill and tap a whole bunch of ports to supply the various systems that we're trying to supply air to. Um, the tank itself is made out of three inch Schedule 40 pipe, which is just under a quarter inch wall, super strong. I have a whole career of working with this stuff and I'm telling you, pipe this big in diameter and this thick of wall thickness is so impact resistant. I am not concerned at all about this tank getting hit by rocks or any of that stuff. And despite what people will try to tell you, this is not a bomb. <laughs> I have seen pipe blow up in people's faces for 15 years and I have never seen an injury from it. It is not like a pound of dynamite sitting there. If this tank got ruptured, the air would escape the tank. That is all that you would see happen. But I guarantee you will not see this tank rupture. We could use these as sliders or bumpers or whatever we want and they would last forever. It's very, very strong stuff we're talking about here. So this has all those different uses. We know it's gonna be impact resistant and now we can move on to why did I size the system with 3 8 line? Well, our maximum output under the best circumstances and conditions is gonna be 11.3 CFM. So we wanna make sure that we don't use a line size that's gonna neck that down and hinder the performance of our compressors. We're trying to make this fast. If you go on Google, you can type in um, quarter inch airline, or so you can do maximum CFM quarter inch airline, maximum CFM 3 8 airline. And you can see what the maximums are for these various tube sizes. I went with 3 8 because I like to oversize a little bit to make sure that even if I use a really long uh, airline to like reach someone's tire or to use an air tool or whatever the situation may be, I don't have enough CFM loss from that distance to hinder the performance of my compressors. So if we use quarter inch line, it's gonna be still a little bit above that 11.3 CFM mark, uh, I believe, I don't remember exactly. But whenever you have 50 feet of airline, you're looking at 10% CFM loss. And then if you look at whenever the air needs to take a 90 degree turn, you have what's called friction loss. And we just wanna make sure that we don't have to worry about any of those scenarios. I can use as many 90s as I want and I use as long of line almost as I want. And we're not gonna hinder the performance of these compressors. So 3 8 has a maximum airflow of 30.05 CFM at 90 PSI, way above and beyond what we need and then we've got uh, 50, uh, 50 feet takes that 10% down. We're not even close to touching the maximum ability of this 3 8 line. On the other side here, we're gonna be uh, piping some different things into a manifold that I'm gonna build and this manifold is gonna supply 
air to our zip lockers, front and rear, and it's gonna supply uh, air to our air switches. I wanna make sure that this is necked down in a couple different spots so we don't um, over pressurize the system. So I have a 100 PSI PRV that's gonna supply the zip lockers. Then it's gonna go through a dryer to make sure that any moisture that made it through the tank is now gonna hit the dryer. Then everything from the manifold after is gonna be dry, clean air at uh, 100 PSI. And then I think I'm gonna try to find a 30, a 30 to 35 PSI PRV that I'm gonna go to the air switches later on. For now, I'm not gonna do that but um, the air switches are going to supply air to our rear airbags and the maximum PSI that I've found is like 35 whenever it's loaded. So I wanna make sure we don't blow those up. That's the whole point of putting these PRVs in there. We don't wanna blow up our air lockers, so 100 PSI is enough to make sure it actuates. But if we had some sort of crazy surge and we went up to 120 or 150, I just don't wanna risk blowing out a seal because um, we had some sort of a situation with the rest of the system. So this is basically all just to protect these sensitive components and pieces. The last thing we should talk about is a pressure switch. It is going to kick on at 90 PSI, kick off at 120 PSI. And I think that that's gonna be adequate for these compressors. Usually, this is just kind of a rule of thumb thing. It doesn't go for everything, but compressors that pump fast are usually not good at high pressure. And then compressors that are good at high pressure usually don't pump fast. It probably has to do with the stroke of the motor and uh, or the stroke of the piston rather that's actually pressurizing the air. But in our system, because they're fast compressors, I don't wanna go up to like 150 or anything like that because I think it's unnecessary. And it's probably just gonna put more long-term damage on a compressor of this type. That's speculation on my part, but just to be safe, there's no reason I need anything over 120 PSI anyway. So do your research, choose your compressors accordingly, choose your manifolds accordingly, choose your, your, uh, your tank material if you're gonna build, and hopefully, this example is a way for you to kind of get in the ballpark of how you should build your system. If you're in a position where you can just buy a tank that's gonna fit your application, or if you own a popular vehicle, there might be some better options for you. For me, I had to build something to fit in an unusual place with an unusual combination of parts, and so I was kind of stuck doing what I have to do. But like anything, building your own tank has its own pros and cons, and you just need to weigh them both before you make your decision for your build. I think it's worth mentioning that not all air systems need a tank. In fact, if all you're gonna do is air up tires, you don't need a tank at all. But for me, this little over a half gallon air tank will add just enough dampening to make it to where I can use an impact or a tool like that on the trail. If you watch this and decide to build your first tank, I highly recommend spraying everything down with soap and water while the tank is full of air. Even if the gauge looks like it's not going down very fast, you still can have a pinhole leak and it's just a good idea to take care of it now. We have ourselves a funky little tank. <laughs> I like this thing, it's kind of funny. I don't know why it's funny to me, but it is. It's just, it's, it's just one of a kind, right? This isn't something you're gonna order out of a magazine. This is something you're gonna build yourself that uh, just specifically to fit whatever job it is that you're doing. So it is currently holding pressure, no problem. I sprayed every joint to make sure that there's no pinhole leaks with just some soap and water and uh, all my joints are holding. So the only, th the only leak that I was able to discover was up here in the testing equipment. And if you have a history in the pipe trades like I do, you know the struggle is real with testing equipment. It seems like that's always where I had my leaks whenever I would test the systems that I used to build. So moving forward, the next episode, I wanna get this tank mounted in place permanently in a, in a place that makes sense and in a way that's gonna make it to where it, it can't come off of this vehicle. That's, this series isn't gonna be about trying to consolidate this all into one or two episodes. It's gonna be about doing it right, communicating with you guys how I'm doing it and why I'm doing it. And uh, we're gonna build a bunch of one of a kind parts and pieces into this air system. It's gonna be a lot of fun. The next episode, I wanna get a bunch of the piping ran. I wanna get this manifold started, the secondary manifold, if not completed. It just depends on if I have enough um, fittings and stuff in the shop to make it work and the orientation that I'm gonna need. So. I don't wanna say we're gonna machine it from scratch, but I, cause I don't have any machining tools, but I have a drill press 
and we're gonna use just some random chunks of uh, thick walled aluminum and we're just gonna drill all the way through it. We're gonna, um, we're gonna tap it all. We're gonna make a manifold that's gonna fit this application perfectly and it's gonna be very mechanical. There's gonna be some really cool offsets and joints and whatnot to make it all work and I love this kind of work. So I appreciate you guys watching me do this stuff because it gives me a reason to do it. Now let's take a couple minutes and just answer a few questions from the last video. The last video was selling my Jeep and buying a Toyota. And the first comment is from River Rats. Hell yeah, I'm glad you're a Toyota guy now. Dude, I have always been a Toyota guy and I'm glad that you're as excited as I am. I am, I'm just, I'm an everything guy. That's the reality of the situation. And you guys are gonna see in these comments, it was a crapshoot between love and hate. It's, it's frustrating to read it as a YouTuber because you want mostly love, but it's like, and it is mostly love, I gotta be honest. But man, when you read Toyota and Jeep guys, the way they talk to each other, or now that I'm a Toyota guy, I'm the enemy, or now that I'm a Toyota guy, I'm the bro, whatever. It's very interesting, and you're going to see these comments, man. It's uh, There's some shots fired here and there, but it's all good. It's just the reality of the situation with YouTube. Humble Bear. Hey, Dirt Lifestyle. Have you looked into Marlin Crawler's RCLT? It's the only long travel I've found that's built specifically for rock crawling. It's definitely on my wish list. I have. I have emailed them twice this week um, with them not responding. <laughs> I'm not even asking for free stuff. I just said, I reached out and was just like, listen, I would love to work with you guys on this. This is exactly what my subscribers want to see is a a way to make IFS high clearance and good in the rocks and whatnot. And I, you know, I linked my channel. I said, I'd love to work with you guys in any capacity, even if that just means I get one of the early kits, I don't care. That is a sweet setup. And I just, I really hope that they reach out back to me and they want to work with me. If any of you guys know anybody down at Marlin Crawler, um, and you have some sort of connection, have them get a hold of me. I seriously want to work with them. Dave Trail, not stoked on this at all. Would love to have seen you do something with a newer Jeep. Well, I've already got a lot of Jeeps, and to be honest with you, I'm kind of bored with Jeeps. I love my Jeeps, and I like wheeling with other Jeeps, but I'm, I'm just not interested in building any other Jeeps right now. So, hope that you like the other content that is going to be associated with this. There will still be Jeep content, but there's also going to be Toyota stuff from now on. Next comment is from T. Tana. 2021 is officially worse than 2020. I hope that that's not because I bought a Toyota. Um, and if it is, I'm going to be doing more than just Toyota content on this channel. Obviously, I still have Jeeps. I still have Land Rovers. Um, one day, I mean, it is another Toyota. One day, I'd like to own a Land Cruiser, and I'd like to own a Baja Beetle. So there's just, there's lots of other things, and I hope that this isn't um, because I bought a Toyota. But if it is, hang in there. There's, there's lots more great content to come, um, Toyota or not. All right, more negativity. Nathan Wolf. Just what YouTube needs, another Tacoma build. Yawn. <laughs> oh, man. It's such a mixed bag in the comments on this video, guys. I'm telling you. Well, there's still other stuff for you here. If uh, this channel is not for you because there's Toyotas and you're just going to be yawning whenever I build custom parts for them, um, I recommend Big Tire Garage and I recommend Willamette Motor and Fab. Those are like my two favorite go-to YouTube channels. And uh, neither one of them are building Toyotas. There were so many negative Toyota comments, I felt like I had to address some. So we're gonna do one last negative Toyota comment and then we're gonna do to one positive comment to cleanse our palate. Andrew Bridges, EU Toyotas, LOL. It was a negative comment, but at least, you know, there's an LOL in there. It's, it's not like a middle finger or anything. Last comment is from 4 by Trail. Love it, bro. Owned a third gen taco before swapping to the Wrangler. Excited for this build. You get it. I love it, man. I. I like just floating from brand to brand. I don't have to be married to one vehicle or one brand. I think that um, there is a lot that you can, a lot that can be enjoyed in multiple vehicles and you definitely get it because you're swapping back and forth between Toyota and Wrangler. And uh, <laughs> thank you very much for the positive comment. It's a nice way to cleanse away some of these negative comments. So I know that I lost some subscribers from buying a Toyota, which to me is ridiculous, but you guys have the freedom to do that. You can jump around just like I jump around from vehicle to vehicle. Feel free to jump around from YouTube channel to YouTube channel. You're certainly not married to me and it doesn't hurt my feelings. I only want people in this community that want to be here and I'm trying to build a community of like-minded individuals, people that love this world enough to not be socked in to one make and model of vehicle. So if you guys enjoyed the video, make sure you give it a thumbs up and subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. Got 
a whole bunch of content coming up from tacos to Jeeps to whatever else your heart desires that is off-road related. It, you're gonna see it on this channel. If you wanna help support the channel, make sure you go to thedirtlifestyle.com. We have t-shirts, hats, neck gaiters, stickers. We have Dirtbag Mafia windshield banners for those of you that are in our Dirtbag Mafia Facebook group. And if you wanna help support us on Patreon, we have a link at our website to our Patreon account as well. If you wanna follow me on social media, I'm at Dirt Lifestyle Nate. We'll see you next time.